the, the uh, secretary of our society, Ellen O'Keefe, rang me up and said, Morris, there's something going on in Enfield. Sounds like a case, poltergeist case. Do you want to investigate it? I said, fine, yes, I'll investigate it. Thinking at that time that I would only be involved for about three weeks. Little did I know. So off I trotted to Enfield and met these people involved in the case. Now, what had happened was this, that the mother had complained that various things as a PK, that psychokinetic phenomena, had been going on in the house. One evening, for instance, the children started cre creating upstairs in the bedroom, and she went upstairs, and the children said to her, well, that chest of drawers over there is moving. And she said, don't be so ridiculous, go to sleep. And she was just about to go out of the room when she saw the wardrobe. There were many witnesses to the case besides the family, because I'm, this is another question I'm often asked. There were outside witnesses in the street who were not involved in the case at all. There was the policeman, who came, the two policemen who came and saw something happen, and uh, saw a chair slide across the floor. Uh, there was a fire brigade, there was a priest, there was the family down the road, uh, the Birkins, the uncle and the aunt and their children, the Nottinghams, the next door neighbours, a neighbour down the road who started complaining that things were happening in her house, the next door neighbours who complained. In fact, they, I go on literally forever, the number of people who were involved as either direct witnesses or indirect witnesses because one doesn't always have to see everything direct. One sometimes picks up the whole feeling by going into the house, and we had visitors galore, I think you can imagine, and people pick up the feeling of what's going on. That's another thing people don't understand about poltergeist cases. It's not just what's happening physically, it's what's happening psychologically as well. It's very important to the case, very important, because psychological factors affect what is going on. I suppose that one of the most extraordinary things about the whole case was the voice. Now, this voice was quite something. And how it started was this. On December the 10th, 1977 we're talking about, I was sitting in the room, in the, in the front room there, downstairs, with the mother and the children, and we were just talking, and suddenly there was whistling. And going on and I thought that's funny it's very sophisticated whistling the children can't whistle like that it sounds like the whistling that Mr Nottingham does he whistles quite a bit next door but he's not there he's at work I thought crazy suddenly a dog barked in the room hmm fine a dog barked in the room but there was no dog there I thought well you know this is even crazier still and I began to think you know Okay, it can whistle, it can bark, and the thing began to turn around in my head. And it went on quite a bit. Then, lunchtime, about lunchtime, Guy Playfair came along, and I said to Guy, this morning I heard a dog barking and whistling in the room, and there was no dog there. And I said, it was a dog barking. Well, he took everything in his stride, he always did. And we decided then that if it could bark, and it could whistle, it may be able to talk. And I said to Guy, well, I'll tell you what, if it happens this evening, I'm going to take the children into the bedroom by themselves and see whether it can talk. Now, this was the day that nine other investigators, most of them scientists, were in the house. So we had quite a lot of people who heard the first noise that was made. About six o'clock in the evening, and everybody was there, got the barking and whistling again. Round about nine o'clock, if I remember rightly, I said to Mrs. Hodson, can I take the children upstairs? I want to do an experiment. She said, okay. I mean, she's used to it by now. She's used to everything. So I took the children upstairs and I got into bed. And in the next bedroom, in the small box room, Guy Playfair was there with his headphones on and we put a microphone in, in the room I was in with the children so he could hear all what was going on. Uh, and the barking and whistling was going on. Then I suddenly said, if you can bark and you can whistle, you can talk. Say my name. Mm, quite a while, nothing happened. 
And suddenly it said, Maurice. I thought, good. <laughs> good, some results. And then I challenged it again. I said, no, that's not my name, because I didn't hear it properly, you see. Got it right, Maurice, something like that. So I said, no, say it again. This time it said, Maurice, quite clearly. Then I challenged it to say, say Dr. Belloc. Dr. Belloc, one of my colleagues, was there that, that night. He's a very famous parapsychologist. And it said, Dr. Belloc. So I knew that we had a voice. Now, what was this voice? How did it work? First of all, when it starts to speak, I thought we had uh, a discarnate voice, what we call discarnate voice, a voice coming from nowhere out of the air. Then I began to realize when I watched the children more carefully, I would watch Janet particularly more carefully, it was seemed to be coming from her direction. Now, her lips weren't moving. Her, li her mouth wasn't moving. Her lips, a slight tremble on her lips, but that's all. But I noticed when the voice spoke, her chest went up and down. So I watched her very carefully. And then, after a while, I challenged her and I said, Janet, that voice is coming from you. She said, oh no, it's not. I said, yes, yeah, it's coming from you, Janet. She says, not. I said, if it's not coming from you, where is it coming from? She says, coming from behind me. I said, uh, you sure? She said, absolutely certain. That voice is not coming from me, it's coming from behind me. So we did a test later on, sometime later. We did a, just a simple test. Not terribly scientific, but a simple test. We put a microphone in front of her throat, one on the back of her neck. And we found that the one on the back of her neck was louder than the one on her throat. Shouldn't be so. We had automatic, two automatic cameras set up in the room, which were controlled by a button from outside the room, so that if we heard anything happening in the bedroom that was untoward, we could start the cameras going. And the cameras used to uh, flash at half-second intervals. And we've got various episodes happening, but here's a particular interesting one. There's three episodes, three camera shots here, half-second intervals. The first camera shot shows a pillow here, apparently going towards the camera, which is over here in front. And we know that that pillow and the one on the, one on the floor there were on the bed here, by the side of Margaret. Now, so we've got a pillow actually going towards the camera now. The second photograph here shows the pillow has now doubled up here and is going in the other direction, like backwards. And the third photograph, a half a second interval, shows the pillow has now come forward again and is resting on top of the one that was on the floor. So in actual fact, we've got the pillow doing a zigzag motion. Well, physically, of course, that's not possible. For some time, for some time, the mother and the children have been telling us that the bedclothes have been flying up the wall and the curtains have been billowing out into the room. Well, we hadn't seen this at all. And we had just had to take it at face value what they told us. But one night, we got a sequence of four pictures on our automatic cameras, which shows that actually happening. Here on the first one, you see the bedclothes, the, the bed cover flying up the wall here, the curtain billowing out into the room, and it was mid-December, mid the, the window was shut tight, no drafts, and yet the, the curtain is billowing out into the room. The next picture shows the curtain has now, the uh, bedclothes have now dropped down, but the curtain is moving because in the first picture that was concave, that was convex and is now concave, so we know the curtain is moving. Uh, Janet here has not moved her hand very much, it's more or less still on her stomach and her thigh. Here the next picture, the curtain has moved again because now it's more or less straight. And in the last picture, the fourth picture, the curtain here has twisted round and the bedclothes has twisted round as though to meet one another. Well you heard the story of levi the levitations in the case. Here we believe we actually have a levitation of the girl flying through the air. And you have a look at Margaret over that side there.
You see Margaret, very, very strange thing for girls to be doing at three o'clock in the morning. There's Janet flying through the air and Margaret is there lying in bed with one foot up the wall and one hand up in the air. You must admit, a bit peculiar, even if she's just jumped. But let's look at the next picture. The next picture shows the same similar thing happening but this time the mother is in the room. Similar thing happening. See? I'll show you the first picture again so you perhaps see them both side by side. Right. Now when I questioned the mother on this I said what was happening at the time? She said Janet was lying in bed and I was talking to Janet. I said then what happened? She says I don't know. She says suddenly Janet was flying through the air. I said now, now let's get this straight. You were talking to Janet and what did Janet do? Did she get, or get out from under the covers, go to the top of the bed and jump? She said, no, I was talking to Janet and suddenly Janet was flying through the air. I said, you sure? She said, absolutely positive. So how did Janet get into that position if she's lying down talking to, Mrs., uh, to her mother? This one is of a similar incident again. It wasn't done once, twice or three times, it kept on happening and usually in the middle of the night. At what, <coughs> Janet from time to time had very, very bad trance, very violent trance situation, so bad at one time that we thought that she might even kill herself. She used to rush over and smash her head on the wall. It was a dreadful thing to see. To see. She used to swear and curse and she was she was so strong, in fact, that at one time she picked up a social worker who was lying on the bed trying to restrain her and threw her straight off the bed. And this social worker, this uh, woman, is an ex-policewoman. And she wasn't a very small woman, I can assure you. Incredible. Anyway, one night, she, when she was in a very, very bad state, we called a doctor who uh, came and he gave her a 10 milligram injection of Valium to quieten her down. Well, 10 milligram would knock an adult out, let alone a child. Um, she went out like a light. Forty, uh, and then we all went downstairs, and the rest of the children, the other children, gone to sleep. We went downstairs. Forty minutes later, there was an enormous explosion. I thought the top of the house had come off. We rushed up the stairs into the bedroom. No Janet. She disappeared in the bed. Well, we looked at the bed. You know, you know what's happened. And then we looked round, and we saw Janet on top of this chest of drawers there's a radio there and a chest of drawers she's on top of the radio she'd been thrown apparently 14 feet across the room and she was either in deep sleep or unconscious because I examined her eyes and everything she was either deep in very deep sleep or unconscious that happened three times that night Oh! What's that? 
the slipper was thrown across the room and hit oh, the no, door as I was holding the door. No, I won't. I won't. As I, the no, white slipper hit the door me. as I was holding the door. Was that 53 years ago? Yes, 53. I counted 53. I think that was right. I asked you again, was it 53 years ago? It was. Thank you. Alright, we've now established that she moved away 53 years ago. And I'll ask you the question again. Did you die this year? You did die this year. Right. Now, why are you in this house? You shouldn't really be here. You understand that, do you? You understand that you really shouldn't be in this house. You do understand you shouldn't be in this house. You do. That was, again, two knocks. It's now doing the rat tat 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 tat. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Are you having a game with me? Oh, oh right. Oh, as I ask the as I ask the question, are you having a game with me? It threw it threw the, the cardboard box and the pillow right in my face. Well, thank you very much. That was a very good answer. Well, the car no, just a minute. I do want it through. Just a minute. Through the cardboard box, the pillow, <laughs> and a heart shape. A square pillow and a heart shape. But right at my face. Oh, <laughs> you Now, what do you think of The one who went cold blind me. The door opened to let her out the door. Yeah. I was learning no. this. No. What happened? No, tell me what happened. Oh. Just careful. Tell me what happened. I was in 
Maybe it's me. Yeah. All of a sudden, I felt something pull me by the arms out yeah. big. Yeah. And I tripped over there and I went there. Yeah. And then it lifted me up. And I saw the door opened and I went out the door and I come flying downstairs. I see the door open on it's on my oh, side. Oh, it's this way. I'm sorry. Come on, look it up then. Come on, look it up. Look it up. Look it up. Look it up. And you know, I oh, saw I heard footsteps. I wasn't sure. I fancy I've been a door for it, out the door. <laughs> well, that's the biggest trick of the lot, huh? Mm. Let me hear you say my name. Come on, let me hear you say my name. Say Dr. Bellock. Come on, let me hear you say that. Right. Let's hear you say Dr. Bellock. Say, say Dr. Bellock. Now, if you squeak the bed, I can't hear you talking. Now, say Dr. Bellock. Come on. Come on, say it for me, Dr. Bellock. Dr. Bellock. I want you to tell me whether you remember what happened to you when you died. Just before you died and just after you died. Two years before I died, I died. I went blind. Then I had a language and I fell asleep and I died in a chair in the corner downstairs. Bill, if you're there, would you answer me the following question? What have you done with Denise's 30p? Head it down to the radio. That's there. Sorry, Bill, can you say that again, please? Head down to the radio. That's there. Right up, Bill. I'll go and look. Thanks so much. Why can't Janet fool you? I'm invisible. You're invisible? Why are you invisible? Because I'm a G H O L T. Did any friends go with you? Yes, all of them. All the dogs, 68 dogs. What have you got 68 dogs for? So that they can protect me from you killing me. They can bite you right off. How can we kill you, Bill? You can shoot me off. Now how do we how can we shoot you if we can't see you, Bill? Fuck me into God. Sorry, I didn't hear that, Bill. I'm going 
to God. By praying to God. So, what you're saying is we can't get rid of you by praying to God. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>